Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to give it another minute just while everyone logs in to the webinar. Um, but in the meantime, I'd love to tell you about some upcoming webinars that we have scheduled for this month. Um, we're ending December strong. We have today's webinar and then three more before the holiday. So next Tuesday on December 9th, we're going to be having a webinar on data, professional judgment and modeling and occupational exposure assessment. And that will be with Dr. Ramachandran from Johns Hopkins Education and Research Center for Occupational Safety and Health. Uh, the following Tuesday on December 15th, we're going to be having a presentation on the impact of historical redlining on birth outcomes and asthma. And we're excited that will be with Anthony Nardone. He is a fourth year student at the UC Berkeley, UC San Francisco Joint Medical Program and recently published his findings on this. Um, also on Wednesday, December 16th, we're going to be having a presentation on fatigue in the workplace, effects of health and performance and measurement consideration with Dr. David Dufresne and Dr. Nate Betke. And that'll be produced in partnership with the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston and the University of Iowa. For more events, you can visit us online at coeh.berkeley.edu backslash about CE. Thank you all so much for joining us for today's webinar. We're really excited to have you here. Um, on behalf of the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health, I want to welcome you to Job Loss, Suicide, and Overdose, a case study on Michigan auto workers, presented by Dr. Alan Eisen. A few housekeeping items before we get started. You will be muted during this presentation. If you'd like to answer a question, please enter it into the online Q&A box. We'll also save time at the end of the presentation to address any questions that you might have. A PDF of the slides along with a list of webinar resources will be available on the webinar's website page. And the presentation is being recorded and is going to be made available on the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health YouTube page and on our website, coeh.berkeley.edu. All participants who logged in with their registration email will receive an email tomorrow with a link to the recording and to the evaluation form. And to fill out that evaluation form for a certificate of completion worth one continuing education contact hour. And at this time, it's my pleasure to welcome our presenter for today. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Eisen. Uh, Ellen Eisen is the Director of the Occupational and Environmental Epidemiology Training Program and Professor in Environmental Health Sciences at UC Berkeley School of Public Health. She's trained in biostatistics and occupational health and has a long-standing interest in survival analysis of chronic disease and occupational cohort studies. Professor Eisen has extensive experience addressing potential selection bias in studies of the health effects of long-term exposure to airborne chemicals and particulate matter in the workplace. Most of her research focuses on large cohort studies of industrial workers and miners. She studied chronic respiratory and cardiovascular disease, mortality in cohorts of truckers and miners exposed to diesel exhaust and dust. And she's also studied cancer incidence and mortality in auto workers exposed to metalworking fluids. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Eisen. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks very much and, and uh, welcome everyone to this webinar. Uh, so I'm gonna be, as Michelle just said, describing some recent work that my group has done this year, uh, looking at suicide, overdose, and worker exit in the cohort of, of auto workers. So as um, I'm gonna begin by giving a little background for, for this study. Um, and as many of you know, I think probably during the entire course of the 20th century, life expectancy has increased and the general health of the US population has improved due to advances in public health and in medicine and treatment for diseases. This is true not only in the US, but in other Western countries, even more dramatically in lower income countries. Children now live longer than their parents who lived longer than their parents, et cetera. And one would expect that these increases would continue. But as some of you may be aware, this actually isn't turning out to be true. And in the US, this increase and there are increasing now mortality rates, particularly for middle-aged Americans and most dramatically for whites without a college degree. On closer inspection, it turns out that this increased mortality rate can be attributed to an increase in fatal overdose and suicide, as well as alcohol-related liver disease. These, disease these, these causes of death have collectively been labeled as deaths of despair, 
by Anne Case and Agnes Deaton, who were the two Princeton economists who first identified this trend in 2015. In 2017, there were 158,000 deaths of despair in the US. That's 5.6% of all deaths. And of these, there were 30% were due to suicide, 26% due to alcohol related liver disease and 44% uh, were due to accidental overdose. And as I, as I, as good, what's gonna be the focus of this presentation is, is the uh, fact that most of these um, excess death rates are actually occurring in middle-aged whites without a college degree. So this is um, the iconic plot of increasing trends of these deaths of despair, drugs, alcohol, and suicide in middle-aged white non-Hispanics. And we see the graph goes from 2000 to 2015. In red, we have um, men and women with less than a, with high school degree or less. And you can see that the red, the red lines are going, increasing over the, over the time period since, since the year 2000. For men, the rates are much higher than for women. And you can see that for men and women with a college degree or more, their, their death rates due to these causes have been relatively stable over this 15 year time period. I'm gonna show you now these same trends broken up by race. And again, um, this is now looking only at uh, people in, who are 45 to 54. Um, and uh, let's see if I can get my... Let me see if I can get my cursor to work here. Can you see if I point to this? I don't know if that works. Um, but so these are, these are death rates for people in middle age from 45 to 54. And you can see that it is um, going up. The trends are increasing most, street, most steeply for whites with less than a bachelor's degree. For blacks, they were not increasing really until around 2013 or so. Uh, when they start to take off um, quite rapidly. But for those blacks or whites with, with a bachelor's degree or more, the death rates due to these three causes, alcohol, drugs, and, and um, suicide, have been relatively stable over the time period. Now I'm gonna show you some, uh, these are uh, trends for suicide. Now what we see is uh, this graph shows you by age on the x-axis, so younger five to 14 over here on the left, increasing decades of age up to the top of 85 years of or, or uh, over 85 at the top. And the blue curve is the, is the death rates by suicide for two, in 2016. And in red, we see the suicide rates for 1999. So the difference from the red to the blue is the, is the increase in suicide rates um, over this time period um, by age. And we can see that the biggest increases occurred here for people basically 45 to 64 years old. And you saw the biggest gains in suicide. It wasn't the very old and it wasn't the youngest. It is people in middle life, which was very striking to the research who identified these, these uh, statistical trends and, and so, um, we became pretty interested in how this might impact the, the workers that we study. One more, uh, another graph here shows the same time period, 1999 to 2016. This is now for drug overdose. Um, and again, uh, we see that the, the, it looks like the rates are increasing for most of the different age groups, but they are highest the highest rates of all are in the people who are middle-aged, 45 to 54. Okay. So uh, what are the causes of these pretty disturbing trends? Um, So the causes of suicide and um, drug overdose, which is what I'm gonna focus on today in my study, uh, has, has been 
several fold. I mean, one is there's been an oversupply of drugs in particular of opioids prescribed for pain and, and then used um, recreationally as well. So there's an oversupply of drugs. There's also reduced economic activity, uh, reduced ep economic opportunity, particularly for those with less education. There's been a, a decline in manufacturing over the same time period I mean, and, and a loss of, of stable jobs for people without college degrees. And job loss, we know there's a large literature on the relationship between job loss, by which I mean involuntary worker exit, um, and depression and suicide. So in 1970, 36% of the um, of US male workers were employed in manufacturing. In 2018, only 15% were. So that's a very dramatic drop in the percent of US males employed in manufacturing in the United States. And for those without a college degree, these, these, um, these were largely good paying jobs with strong employer employee relationships and good job security and benefits, uh, you know, retirement benefits. And these have really declined and in their place, what's, what's increased are, are more precarious work, gig economy where, where um, uh, your employment is much less stable. This is a graph here that shows what, what I'm talking about with the rise of manufacturing in the blue starting in 1948, increasing um, in the 1960s, 70s, until maybe the late 70s when there was a drop in the blue and uh, the number of, 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 employ of employees in manufacturing drops. So, sort of, well, it plateaus a while and then it precipitously declines. And so that steep, this, this time period here in, this, in the uh, 80s, 90s, and 2000s, that's really where, where I'm gonna be focusing today in my, in my study of, of the auto worker cohort. Okay, so together, these, we have two simultaneous trends. Um, we have the increase in midlife mortality due to deaths of despair and we have a decline, decline in manufacturing, um, steep decline in manufacturing. So this brings us to our, my main study question, which is, can I, can I see, can I look and see if job loss in the auto industry is related to increased risk of deaths due to these causes? And I have a large cohort of, of, U, of UAW, General Motors workers, um, who I've been following for mortality for many, many years. Um, and it's, so it, it offered the opportunity to actually see whether we, whether we can find evidence of these trends within our own study population. Okay. Oh, mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you now a little bit about the, uh, the uh, general, the GM UAW cohort that I that I have been working with for many years. Um, so, oops, did I skip something here? I might have skipped something. I do. I do actually want to say something here about the U.S. automobile industry in general, and and what has impacted it, and what has impacted it, and led to and explains partly the decline. Um, there were a series of, of events that happened. There was an oil embargo in 1979. Then there was China entering the w World Trade Organization and Chinese supply, supplies uh, coming into the US. There were foreign hybrids. Um, there were stronger vehicle safety regulations and all these events, all these things hit the domestic automobile market um, and uh, presented quite a challenge. And by 2008, uh, Toyota became the largest automaker in the world, which was actually a title that General Motors had held for 77 years. So it's a very dramatic decline. Okay, so now I'm gonna tell you about my, my cohort. So I have, a, I have a study of UAW GM employees. Um, it was a study that was originally designed to look at the, at the health effects of exposure to metalworking fluids. Um, it was a study that was jointly funded in 1985 by General Motors and the UAW Union. Um, the, um, 
let's see. Uh, let me get my place here. So in the 1980s, the UAW and General Motors negotiated a health and safety fund uh, that the workers and the automakers would, would both contribute to. And the money was to be spent on health and safety research. And part of that was that they formed a health and safety advisory board of outside, of outside scientists to oversee the process of, of, um, of funding research. And in 1985, Harvard competed for a project to study metalworking fluids and was ultimately awarded a five-year contract. And as part of that study, I was a part of that original study and we identified three plants in Michigan um, as the site for our study. One was located in the urban center of Detroit. Another was located 50 miles west of Detroit in a town called Ypsilanti. And a third plant was, was located up more upstate in, in Saginaw, Michigan, which is a small, once thriving lumber and manufacturing city. I was a postdoc at the time and involved in the original study design and field work. So I've been at this for, for 30 years. Uh, so the cohort, a little more about it. Um, it consists of 48,000 auto workers and we have individual level data on these workers. Um, we have um, employment records that were provided by GM and we got those records for all workers who were ever employed at each of these three plants and who worked for more at least three years. The cohort included mostly white men, but it was 20% women and 15% black. And we, the, the study was a mortality study and we looked um, for, for deaths and causes of death from 1941 to 1985 originally, and then subsequently we've extended follow-up several times and most recently until 2015. Um, so uh, a few more words about the cohort. Um, originally, as I mentioned, it was designed to study the health effects of metalworking fluids there was a very extensive uh, retrospective exposure assessment. Metalworking fluids are composed of petroleum-based mineral oils and chemical additives, and they're sprayed um, in order to lubricate and cool when you um, machine metal. And uh, we have published dozens of papers over the years linking exposure to metalworking fluids to, to um, various cancers, in, you know, particularly prostate cancer, female breast cancer, bladder and stomach cancer, and melanoma skin cancer. But I'm not gonna be talking about metalworking fluids and cancer today. I'm gonna tell you now about a different study that we did in this same population to look at suicide overdose and overdose. Um, and the question was, is job loss related to these outcomes? Um, so um, we're gonna restrict our attention to the later years of follow-up. Remember that I said our follow-up started in 1941, but now we're gonna just look at 1970 forward because we wanna focus on the time period during which the, the, the auto industry was in decline. And um, it's important to note that by the end of the follow-up in 2015, all three study, all three study plants had closed had shut down. So there was a lot of job loss during this period. And we're gonna then restrict the cohort. We're gonna look at a subset of our original cohort and only focus on those workers who were still employed in 1970 or hired afterwards. Um, and that's who I'm gonna be reporting on to you today. So we had two hypotheses. Um, First was that the risk of suicide and overdose increase after leaving work. Um, and that hypothesis is, ascent, is equivalent to believing that active employment is protective and that leaving, it's leaving work that increases the risk. The second hypothesis is that the risk of suicide or overdose increase if you leave work before you're eligible for retirement benefits. Now retirement, uh, 
so uh, basically the the we we looked we wanted to to try to distinguish voluntary from involuntary job loss now the based on the bureau of labor statistics the quit rates quit rates in the auto manufacturing industry were relatively low during this time period so most worker exit up until retirement was probably involuntary our employment records that we got from the company don't include the reason that someone leaves work so we decided to use age at leaving work as a way to measure, as a way to determine whether somebody was likely to be leaving involuntarily or not. So our hypothesis was that leaving work before retirement is likely to be involuntary and that leaving work before retirement is, is therefore more likely to be harmful and increase risk of these deaths of despair. So, um, we then uh, measured exposure. In, basically, I'm calling it exposure. It's not metal working fluid exposure. Now it's exposure, uh, which is gonna be le measured as, which is work or exit or leaving work. And we're gonna measure that in two ways. The first is just as a, as a, as a measure of whether you're active or inactive, actively employed or inactive in every year. Um, so it's just a measure of your employment status. Were you at work or were you already, had you already left work? And the second way we're measuring work or exit is by the age at which you leave. And that's to try to distinguish voluntary from involuntary leaving. And then for the outcomes, we're going to be looking at suicide alone and then suicide combined with fatal overdose. This is a, a diagram which shows um, uh, our assumptions about sort of the structure of what we believe is going on. So we have the plants that we're studying and we're going through time and we begin up here at the top left. Uh, time is going on, plants are beginning to downsize. And when plants downsize, that may cause depression, may cause workers to get be, become anxious, worry about losing, whoops, losing their jobs. Plants downsizing may lead directly to an increase in suicide. That's this arrow here, directly to suicide or fa and ink fatal overdose. Downsizing can also will cause some people to lose their jobs. And that job loss may have something to do with your race, your sex, and when you were actually hired. And that job loss may cause you, may cause you to become depressed. If you weren't already, it may exacerbate depression if you already were. In fact, it could be that if you are depressed and anxious, you may be more likely to lose your job. At any rate, the, 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 the arrow that, that we're most interested in studying in here is the relationship between job loss and risk of suicide and fatal overdose. Um, what else I wanna say about this is that, um, so we, 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 don't, we, haven't, we don't measure, we have no information on whether people are depressed in our cohort. So we can't, take, we can't take account of that directly, but we can, we do know sex, race and, hire, and date of hire, and we know the um, downsizing information for the plants. So we're gonna fit some Cox proportional hazard models with survival models to link exposure and outcome, to link worker exit with suicide. And we're gonna measure the association with hazard ratios. And we're gonna adjust for age, race, plant, year of hire and calendar year of follow-up in our, in our uh, models. And unfortunately, depression, which is quite possibly um, a predictor of job loss and suicide. So it's really a confounder. We, we didn't, did not measure, so we can't control for that. So this is a table that describes our cohort. Um, we had 20, almost 27,000 subjects who were at work in 1970 or after. And this is the breakdown by race, 72% white, 20% black, 8% unknown. This is the breakdown in the three plants. Um, and um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about this in a minute, but we only had complete work records um, up until 1994. So we have complete work records for 73% of the cohort. Uh, the year, median year of hire for this group was 1967. 
The mean age at, median age at hire was 24. The median age at worker exit was 49. And the median year of death was 1999 among the deceased. We had 203 suicide cases and 55 fatal overdoses. Uh, here we see the, um, what they're called histograms that describe the age at death for the people who died of suicide on the left and for those who died of fatal overdose on the right. And what you can see is there's a pretty wide range of age at death, mostly in 40 to 60 range um, for both and a lot more deaths due to suicide than overdose. And these are the rates, the rates of uh, suicide on the left and both suicide and fatal overdose combined on the right. And we see time on the x-axis here from 1970 to 2015, 2017 um, in both. And the rate is per 10,000 people. So you can see that the rate is going up to about two, three, up to maybe a little over two per 10,000 due to suicide um, in the 90s. And then it, it started to decline and it went down for a couple of decades, for a decade. And then it rose again around 2007 or eight um, for suicide. When you look at fatal overdose combined with suicide, you see a sort of more obvious increase uh, in the later half of the time period where it looks like due to overdose, things are really, are increasing up to closer to, to what is this, uh, whoops, uh, whoa, wow, what happened, hold on. Up to, how high is this? This is almost like maybe three and a half per 10,000. Okay. So one, um, before getting to the results, uh, I want to mention another, this other limitation of our study, which is that um, I told you our study was designed in 1985. We had work records up till 1985 in the beginning. And then in 1994, we went back to General Motors and UAW and said, can we extend our work records up to 94? And they said, yes. And we went back and Xeroxed a lot more employment records up through 94. But after that, we were not given access to any further employment information. So even though we were able to continue to follow the, the deaths in our cohort up to 2015, we only had work information up until 1994. So this means that, for example, if you have a worker one here who was hired in the 1960s and left work in 1990, we have his entire or her entire employment history. But if, the, if, she was, if somebody was hired later, say in 1980, and was still at work in 1994, we don't know when they left. We know they were still there in 1994, but we don't know when they left. So we're trying to measure worker exit and suicide risk. We don't have information on worker exit for somebody like worker two. So we're gonna have to deal with that in our analysis, which we do. So, um, the way we did the analysis was we had two models, two statistical models for worker exit and suicide. Um, in the first model, um, the first model, worker exit is just measured as whether you were at work or off work. We don't worry about the age at which you left. It's just were you still employed or not employed in every year. Follow-up begins at hire or in 1970. And if you were still employed in nine, on, when those work records ended, we censored you. So we, we don't, you, don't, you can't continue to be um, counted in our analysis. Um, for the second model, where we looked at worker exit defined by age, um, their follow-up begins when somebody leaves work, because we're only interested in whether younger people are at higher risk than older people when they leave. Um, and so here we're going to exclude subjects who are still at work in 1994 because their work records were incomplete. And um, so these are the two 
Cox models. And here's the results from our first model. So I'll take this slow. Um, these are adjusted hazard ratios. These are hazard ratios here. HR has hazard ratio, hazard ratio. And I'm showing you two models. Let's just focus first on the model on the left um, where we're measuring exposure, job exit status as either you're at work or you're not at work. And if you're not at work, that means you've left work. And we can see that of the 179 suicides, that's the total here, of the total number of suicides, 21 of them occurred to someone who was still actively employed. So that's what we call the reference group. And then compared to, to being, we can see that if you were not at work, your, your risk ratio was 17 times higher of, getting, of, of having a suicide outcome. So this is an enormously high um, ratio, rate ratio. It says that your, in, your, your risk of suicide was 17 times higher if you had already left work. This, this hazard ratio was so large uh, that we were a little bit um, skeptical. And we worried that maybe there was, there was some fuzziness or imprecision in the date of um, worker exit. Remember, after all, these are not data that we collected for study purposes. These are based on administrative employment records. There's probably mistakes. Employment records have mistakes in them. We were worried, suppose somebody commits suicide over the weekend and then at work they find out on Monday that the, that the worker has passed away. He had been actively employed, but maybe they go back and they date his worker exit, his date of termination as the previous Friday. So maybe there's some jiggering of the end of work dates that we hadn't taken account of. So we went back and said, okay, if your suicide occurred in the week after you left work, we're gonna assume that there was something funny about that end of work date. And we're gonna call that, we're gonna reclassify that as, as somebody who's, who died at work, who committed suicide while, while still employed. So we added another six cases to the reference group. And when we did that, the hazard ratio came down from 17 to 12 still it was so it was lower but it was still enormously high so this is pretty strong evidence here that being having left work is a risk increases your risk for suicide um so here's the the second uh the second uh, whoop, whoop, back one this is the second model this is the model where now whoop, now we are measuring um worker exit by the age at which you, you were when you left. So if you were older than 55, we think you were likely to have left for retirement reasons. That is what we're gonna use as our reference group. There were 42 of those who committed suicide. And over here in this other model, we're combining suicide and fatal overdose. So there were 45 in that reference group. And then we compare the risk of suicide for people who left work when they were 40 to 54 to those who are 55 and older. And we see that it's elevated 1.2 times higher. Those who were in their thirties, the hazard ratio is 1.7. So they were more, even more, more likely uh, to commit suicide. And then here are the youngest group, those in their twenties. Again, elevated, all three elevated. Um, this middle one, 1 1.7, is the only one that actually is statistically significant, which we can tell because the bottom li lower limit of the confidence interval is over one. When we combine suicide and fatal overdose, we see an even stronger effect of eight, the age at which you were when you left. And we see relative risks here, which are hazard ratios of, of twofold sig and statistically significant for people who left work in their 20s or 30s relative to those who stayed into their into their 50s. We then wanted, we then were a little concerned, well, maybe somebody left work in their 40s and they didn't commit suicide for another 20 years. Can we really feel confident that, that, that there's a causal relationship between those events? So we decided to truncate follow-up at five years. That is, we only were gonna include uh, events, suicides or, or overdoses that occurred within five years of leaving work. And when we did that, we lost cases. So we have fewer N here because we're only looking at those which occurred within five years of leaving work, but we still see elevations both for suicide 
and, and stronger for suicide combined with fatal overdose. So this is essentially showing the same data, but now I'm treating age as a continuous variable from 20 to 55. Um, just looking at the hazard ratios for suicide and over here for suicide and fatal overdose. And you can see that the hazard ratio increases to a maximum in, for people in their, who were in their 30s when they left work on the left. And then if you go to the right, that, that maximum is even higher. So the relative risk is even higher. The hazard ratio was over two fold. Um, and we can see, and it then goes down the older you get. So these are just a different way of looking at the same data, but as a, as a continuous variable, same patterns. So now um, I wanna focus attention uh, on plant two, which is the plant, um, one of the three plants, it's the one that was located in Ypsilanti Township, which is a small township 50 miles west of Detroit in between Detroit and Ann Arbor. And plant two accounted for 38% of the people in our cohort but it actually accounted for 46% of the suicides, so a higher proportion of the suicides, and 62% of the overdoses, which is a quite striking dis disparity. So it looked like something was going on more so in plant two that was putting people at risk. So I'll tell you a little bit about the history of plant two. Plant two uh, was built on the site of the famous Willow Run plant. I don't know if any of you know what Willow Run is. It was a plant built by Ford Motor Company to support the war effort by producing mass producing World War II bombers. And at the time, it was the largest plant in the world and employed 100, over 100,000 people. And this Willow Run plant was located in Ypsilanti County. Um, and after the war, um, Ford sold the plant to General Motors. And Gen General Motors turned it into an auto, an auto manufacturing plant. And in 1970, and was one of our study plants, and in 1970, Plant 2 employed 10,000 UAW workers making automatic transmissions for cars. That plant closed in 2010. It was part of GM's bankruptcy proceedings. And in 1970, what, now going back in 1970, the population of Ypsilanti Township was 30,000. Today it's 20,000. So there's a huge population decline. You know, talk about loss of economic opportunity and um, economic depression. So, um, in conclusion, I'd say that in our Michigan, our Michigan auto workers who left work had a higher risk of death from suicide or overdose than those who remained actively employed. It also looks like those who left work before retirement age had higher risk, which we interpret as evidence that it's involuntary job loss that increases, um, that can lead to increased risk of suicide and fatal overdose. So this, this paper uh, was published earlier this year. I have a lot of co-authors. Um, here's the whole list of co-authors. And uh, so you can, you can find it if you'd like to read it online. <laughs> um, and now I'm happy to answer any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much for this presentation. We really appreciate you sharing your time with us. Um, at this time, if you have any questions, you are welcome to enter it into the online Q&A box, and I'm happy to um, bring them up. Um, one of the questions that we have here um, is just related. It's a note about stress. Um, the problems that everyone experiences usually occur due to mental stress. What can we do to be able to control our mental stress over problems, problematic situations? Um, and a way to reduce that overdose and stress. Do you have any suggestions there? Do I have any suggestions? <laughs> Do I have any suggestions? Wow. No, that's, that's, that's a big one, man. <laughs> well, we'll give you the biggest one. You know, solve it for all of us in society right now, right here. 
<laughs> no, Any no. thoughts that you have to share? No. Uh, can, I, can I, maybe Andy Kamai would like to address that fact. I just saw that he's out there in the audience. Can the audience speak? Oh, let's see. Um, Andy, Andrew Kamai, let's see if we can. I, I can, yes, I can. Andrew, um, I'm not sure if he has heard us say him there, but. Yeah, I just hit the unmute unmute button. I don't know. There what was go. the question? Uh, how, to, how to reduce stress? Is that the... Yeah. Uh... Hi, Andy. <laughs> hey, Ellen. Yeah, well, one thing just to note about the Willow Run plant was that it was open, you know, as a large machining plant, made engines, um, and, and they invested a lot of money in a nearby plant in Romulus, you know, just a, a few miles away. And so you had this point where you have a plant that's kind of older and dysfunctional and and uh, workers are going to the other plant, some transferring to the other plant to a modern facility. So, so there's this sort of whipsawing that happens where it's even more stressful because you have this, you know, there's fewer opportunities to leave and you're stuck in a plant where they're not investing. And so that might be an interesting, you know, in the, if we can get that extra data to show which people transferred to Romulus and which people were sort of stuck in the older crummy plant. Right, and actually, you're, you're, you know, you raise another um, point, which is a, which is a limitation in our data, which is that when when somebody leaves one of our three study plants, we don't know where they go. So it is quite, you know, it's quite possible that someone leaves and goes to Romulus and goes to work there, or they go to work someplace else at some other, um, you know, auto manufacturing plant. I think our assumption is that. Um, more likely, I mean, actually, Andy, you can probably speak to this, but more likely, you're not going to be going to a job that's better. You know, if you're leaving, if you're leaving one of these auto jobs in the 1990s, um, chances are that you know wherever you manage to go, uh, you're not going to have the same kind of benefits that you once had. Um, so, and in terms of, um, well, in terms of stress, I mean losing a job is pretty stressful. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think <laughs> you don't really need to look too much further to see how, how awful that can be. And we're reminded of it right now. I could also add that during COVID, we've had a lot of unemployment and a lot of job loss. So the results of this study seem, you know, if, if anything, more pertinent to, to, and more generalizable to, to larger segments of the population today, you know, beyond just manufacturing workers. Yeah, and that actually touches on one of the questions that someone had asked is um, what parallels you might see between job loss then and the job loss that has been created by the COVID-19 yeah. pandemic. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a really, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, it's a worrisome fact that I, I wouldn't be surprised to see um, rates for suicide and drug overdose and alcohol related disease increasing as a result of this pandemic. Um, and we don't have the, you know, we don't have the data yet to, to see whether that's true because it takes a while before these data become available to look at. But I think nobody would be very surprised. And, you know, it's not just on, it's not just job loss in the case of the pandemic, it's also, you know, isolation and, and other, um, you know, other things that, that increase people's um, unhappiness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and kind of, um, I guess this, this is taking it in a different direction, but in addition to the decline of the auto industry, were there other social or economic co-founding factors within the geographical area that you were looking at that you think might've influenced the, the data? I mean, well, this is, um, you know, so what, what, well, the, the manufacturing decline is not just auto. I mean, it was manufacturing, you know, sort of writ large. Um, and, I, you know, I mentioned that one of the sites of these plants up in Saginaw had been a lumbering lumber center. And I would imagine that those jobs were also becoming um, harder, to, harder to hold on to. Uh, yeah, so. Thank you. Yeah. Just, just to, am I allowed to butt in again, Helen? I don't sure. know. Good. So this is Andy UAW again. The, the the Saginaw plant was a large complex. The Saginaw steering facility was they generated you know gears for steering columns. Um, in the late '90s, that the GM split and so they created a company, Delphi. Um, Delphi was then outsourced. All the Delphi manufacturing was outsourced to you know overseas. 
And that particular facility was sold to a Chinese uh, auto parts company. So you have this long period of a couple decades of having people, again, they, they lost this GM job. Maybe they've flowed away from that facility. Uh, workers lost their benefits um, as the site transitions to a you know Chinese owned facility. So again, it's a, you have a long period of, of stress uh, where you're uncertain about what the plant is going to keep making and who owns it. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, and another thing that that you asked about what else was going, you know, other things that were going on was there also was this, you know, increase during this time period in the amount of pain that people have, physical pain. And, and so I think that also gave rise to this increase. This was then, you know, around the end of the 90s, 2000s, to the flooding of the market with these opioids, which has just exacerbated, I think, a lot of the despair that people feel it doesn't, it's not so clear it even helps with chronic pain and it, um, you know, is addictive and, um, you know, has caused its own, you know, path of misery. Yeah, its own suite of problems, thank you. Um, have you seen any comparable studies done in other manufacturing towns? Um, so Pittsburgh and Cleveland were the ones that came to mind for our, our attendee. Um, I haven't, I haven't seen it for those particular towns, but we are doing we are doing a study uh, of miners, but these are actually miners out west, and and mine it turns out that these miners have even high, have higher rates of um, these of these causes of death than the than the auto workers do, and um, and I think that may be something that we already knew historically that miners and maybe construction I think have higher rates of, of suicide than other occupations. I don't think auto workers were high on the list, anybody's list for being particularly at risk for suicide, but I think miners had some history there and we are seeing sort of similar patterns for them. Mm -hmm. um, no, but if anybody's got any data they'd like to give us in Philadelphia or where else was it Cleveland, you said mm -hmm. Cleveland or? we'd be happy to take a look. Yeah, in Pittsburgh as well. It's Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, well, actually we, 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 were, we were launched, we were about to look at it in a, in a cohort of Alcoa employees and, and their headquarters are in Pittsburgh, um, but, but we weren't able to, to do that study as it turned out. Thank you. And also we had um, someone share an article in the chat. So I will paste that out for everyone. Um, it's an AMA issue brief on opioid and other drug related overdoses related to COVID-19. Um, oh, really? So tangential article um, that's now in the chat for, for everyone listening in today. I would like to see that. Yeah, I would yeah, like to well, see that. I'll make sure to, um, on our website, where we post okay. uh, the update for your webinar, um, we'll, we'll include some resources there as well. So everybody listening today, if you will miss it from the chat box, check our website uh, tomorrow and it should be there for you as well. Uh, no, is that it shows increases in 40 states of wow. opioid uh -huh. overdose fatalities. Um, wow. yeah. Okay, uh-huh. No, I'd like to see that. It's great. Yeah, I mean, not great, it's not good, it's bad. Good, good to know about. <laughs> good to know about. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another question also kind of on similar studies, if you've seen anything with, among agricultural producers in the agricultural workforce, if you're aware of any studies in those industries. Um, I'm not, but I guess, again, I mean, it wouldn't be surprising. Uh, I think people in rural states, agricultural states are having a hard time that the economy is tough now. Um, with, and the pen, no, I haven't seen any data, but I wouldn't be surprised. Mm -hmm. um, no. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we also have some questions kind of specifically related to um, factors and co-funding factors within your study. Um, one was asking if you were able to look at the timing of specific plant clo closures um, and increased death rates. That, that's a good, question and the answer is I think no <laughs> no not for lack of wanting to and maybe not for lack of effort um because we did we did know I mean Andy actually is Andy knows that we know we knew the dates of the closures of those plants um uh but here's the problem. No, I know the answer. The problem is we couldn't look at it because remember I told you how I told you all about how our work records ended in 1994. So we actually did not could not see. We tried to get extended work records, 
but we weren't able to do that. So we could not look and answer that question, but that's a really important question. I mean, it would have been incredibly interesting. And if we had gotten extended work records on our cohort, we would have been able to look at that question. That would have been fascinating. But Absolutely. We weren't. Well, I guess I think this kind of ties into that theme, you know, the, the availability of data and information. Um, but someone was curious about whether um, employees received any monetary payout, payouts if they were laid off or let go or and how that might have factored into any suicide trends. I mean, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, maybe Andy does or somebody else here from the UAW, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I would say, you know, this kind of touches on, you know, the, the importance of, of data and what is and isn't accessible and, and how, how we do our best with what we have and, and how we formulate right. study questions. No, you're, you're absolutely right, Michelle. <laughs> yeah, right. And this, this study, you know, it's really been an enormous treasure to have these data for the lab. We, we, you know, we've been able to use it mostly to look at studies, you know, questions about the health effects of metalworking fluid exposure, but I was really an opportunity to, to be able to look at a completely different sort of question about these deaths of despair and job loss in this population. Yeah. And from an epidemiologic perspective, um, thinking about kind of a translation of this into COVID-19, yeah. you know, how long do you think it would take for us to be able to have any sort of evidence-based data on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on, on the workplace? Well, I'll tell you something. So I, I'm actually in a conversation with a, with a research group at Berkeley trying to answer this question. <laughs> and so it turns out you can't get um, mortality information. There's a lag of a year or two. Um, so then we, we were we were thinking we would look at emergency room visits for um, attempted suicides, you know, or, or overdoses that aren't that turn out not to be fatal, right? Um, and so uh, we would like to do that, but we don't have we don't have we don't have the current data to to do that now. But it's accessible; you just have to pay to get it. Mm -hmm. but, it, but without any funding, what we, were, what we were trying to do is to see whether if we look at Google searches for suicide and related terms, whether we can look at trends in those Google searches as a surrogate for suicidal risk, for suicide, suicide ideation, and use that as a marker and look at unemployment versus and, um, and these uh, Google trends. Um, so we'll see how that, if that turns out to be possible. Uh, so that's how we're going at that right now. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I was just thinking too, in terms of how long you've been studying this specific cohort and, you know, how, how long you've been accumulating, <laughs> cumulatively looking at the data, yeah. um, the, the benefits of those kind of longitudinal studies and how early we are, relatively speaking, it feels like an eternity, but how early, relatively speaking, we are um, in the impact. Right. I mean, I guess you're right, Michelle, in the sense that we could even look at the death data we have on this cohort. Well, we don't have it. We'll have to wait till the mortality data are available, but then we could look for spikes, you know, rel related to COVID. Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, eventually. Um, someone was also curious if you've done any work on alcohol deaths in this population. Yes, we have. And I was actually going to show you, I, I could show you some of those results as well. Um, and um I mean, originally we, we put alcohol related liver disease to the side because it's a more chronic disease. You have to drink you know, heavily for many, many years. Mm -hmm. It's not impulse death and it's not, right? Um, so, but we, we have looked at it now and we haven't, but we haven't looked at it in relation to job loss for the reason I just said, because it's something you would, you know, you need to be drinking too much for way before you lose your job to actually see a death after you lose your job. So, um, but we have been looking just at the patterns of alcohol um, related liver disease, mortality in our cohort. And, and we see, um, I probably should have added a slide, right? Was going, which shows that, let's see, I, I think it, it, you know, it went up, it went down and I think it's going up again, something, something over this time, over the time period. Um, but that's for a later, I'll come back next year and I'll talk about that. Oh, good. We'd be happy to have you again. <laughs> um, someone also just was bringing up the 
um, how, how it easy or difficult, you know, that it, there doesn't seem to be an easy way to separate out the protective nature of employment versus the protective nature of financial security, um, and also the medical insurance of employment. Um, and that, you know, just Americans have to stay employed in order to stay healthy and kind of right. how that, how our system is structured. Um, right. do you have a, I guess it was more of a comment, but if you have any feedback that you'd like to add. Yeah, I mean, I guess the only feedback I would give is that I think the value of work is more than you know, more than money. I think money is necessary, but probably not sufficient to to you know feel to have a feel productive and engaged, and having meaningful work um, uh, is obviously important. You know, in its own you know for its own sake as well. So, and I think that a lot of these jobs in manufacturing, even though they even though they were hard and and sometimes dangerous. I think there was a real sense of belonging and, and, and you know, attachment that you know, miners and auto workers had to these jobs, which is probably, which is not so true if you're um, you know, driving for Uber and um, doing DoorDash or whatever, and don't get invited to the office party. It's like, you're not really a part of the, um, of the organization. You know, you're more peripheral. So I think that's harder for people nowadays you know that kind of work no absolutely and it, it makes me think that that sense of belonging that you feel working with organizations yeah. or don't feel working with organizations and the influence on identity and mental health and all right. those factors right absolutely for sure um someone also had a question about um if you're aware if there's any efforts or in, if you know of any companies that are looking at um employees I guess what steps can a company take for employees who have personal problems that are, are struggling? Yeah, I mean, I don't, in answer to that question, we are doing some work, at least colleagues at now are, are trying to look at grocery store workers. I think the, you know, manufacturing is probably not coming back in the US to the, you know, to the extent that it was once here. And so, you know, much more employment is in the services sector where there are not good protections and where, you know, and particularly like grocery store workers who've been really like essential workers during the pandemic, I'm sure suffer tremendously from stress and, you know, anxiety as well as COVID. And so um, what, what can employers do to, to, to improve the lives of their employees? They can, I mean, I think, you know, benefits <laughs> are really important and I don't know, uh, you know, I'm not an economist. I don't know how that's going to work on a large scale, but I, I feel like that really needs to happen at a large scale, that these service workers need to have more protections um, in order to survive. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much for all of your feedback. Um, I do see we have a couple of more questions in the chat here. It looks like we do have a couple more minutes. Um, someone was asking if you've had a an opportunity to look at occupational injury leading to prescription opioids or stress factors. I mean, that's, that's a fabulous question. And that's exactly what we would have loved to do in the Alcoa cohort where we had in, information on injury, because that's part of the, I mean, I, I don't know if that was in my diagram, but I mean, part of the causal chain can be, you know, could be you get injured at work, you get opioid prescribed to you, you get addicted, you get depressed, blah, blah, blah. So I think injury is probably a large Mm -hmm. part of um is a large piece of that causal chain um and then you know you're more likely to lose your job you can't be disabled mm -hmm. and you know so for sure injuries that would be a really important piece of it absolutely yeah mm -hmm. thank you so much yeah, yeah great question um and great then question. yeah yeah we have lots of great <laughs> questions too yeah, yeah. Do. um Someone also commented, um, Dayton points out that healthcare costs were 5% of GDP in 1960 and 18% in 2018. And this massive transfer of income is a big factor in deaths of despair. Do you have any comments on that theory? <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I think healthcare delivery in this country is so messed up. I mean, you know, we pay so much for it. It doesn't work that well. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a huge problem. I mean, I think it impacts all of us in, in negative ways. Um, and, and yeah, and, I'm, and in terms of mental health services, I mean, probably particularly so, you know, really deficient. Employer-based, you don't get it. If you leave work, you know, you don't, you lose your, not only do you lose your job, you lose your 
support, you lose your health insurance. Yeah, I think I'd say. Yeah. Oh, especially right now too, what we've seen with the, the pandemic crisis is yeah. you know, if you, if you lose your job, you're also losing your healthcare. And right. what does that look like during really, the pandemic? <laughs> yeah. Really bad. Really. Yeah. Well, do you have any, any final thoughts or comments you'd like to kind of close us with today? I'd like to close on a cheerier note if I could find one. It's not a very cheery topic. <laughs> it's not a very cheery topic. Um, I guess we have, maybe we have a vaccine coming. Maybe that's a, that's a cheerier. Yeah. <laughs> no. Well, thank you so much for your time today. And, and while this may not be a, a, a cheery topic, it's it's essential and so important. And thank you so much for, for sharing this information. And also, um, you know, as we think about what, what the implications of the research that you're doing in your recent study and publication has for what we're all facing right now on, on a, a global yeah. level. So thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, thank you also to everyone who joined us for today's webinar. Uh, you can check out our website for more information and other upcoming events at cuh.berkeley.edu backslash about CE. Um, you'll also receive an email reminder out tomorrow with a webinar recording and an evaluation link for those who logged in today with their registration emails. And that evaluation link will allow you to get your certificate of completion for this event. Thank you so much for the participation and the wonderful questions. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.